Morning, guys. Morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning you've given to us. Thank you for these men who got up this morning to come to hear about you. Lord, I thank you because I know you're going to speak to their hearts. I know that your word will find a place in their heart that they might not only hear but do that which the Spirit is speaking today. Lord, in this nation, we need revival. We need to wake up. And I ask, Lord, that this conference would be part of what you do to awaken this nation. Use these men, Lord, after they leave this place to reach others for Jesus Christ. We lift this to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. You may be seated, fellas. Let's open our Bibles together to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I want to share with you what I'm going to call a foundation, just to lay a foundation for the rest of the day. The the theme is obedience. And uh, I wanted to share with you about what it means to follow the Lord out of uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. And I want to share with you a little bit about being a disciple. Because you're not going to be obedient if you're not a disciple. So obviously what we need to do is begin at the foundation. And the foundation would be that we are followers of Jesus Christ. And so it's a blessing. It's always a blessing to be able to come and to spend time with, with men and share with men as a man. Um, you know, when you speak to uh, mixed congregations of our, our ladies and our men, sometimes we're not as straight as we could be uh, straight talking. I'm always straight. But straight talking, I'll give you a moment to think about that one. (laughs) And so I I have a tendency of being a little more open-hearted when I speak to the fellas. And so that's what we'll be doing today. We'll be looking at Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, and what it means to be a follower of the Lord, laying a foundation the other men will build on. So beginning at verse 57, reading to verse 62, It happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What we have here in this passage is Jesus ministering to what we would call three would-be disciples. I, I find it interesting to note, even as we begin, I want you to see this with me. I find it interesting that instead of welcoming them, To follow him. Notice that he issues a challenge to them. So the question is this. Why did Jesus issue a challenge? Why did he not simply soften the call? Because what we have today, speeding up to the 21st century, is a softening of the call. You're, you're, You're hearing people preach messages on TV and in some very large churches that really soften the call. It doesn't call for a demand of anything. No sacrifice of any sort for you to make. All you need to do is just follow the Lord to whatever degree you want to follow him. You don't even have to worry about whether the word of God says certain things because the Bible isn't even taught in the church. What we're trying to do is we're trying to add to the church numbers and money. That's basically what it is. We want buildings, we want projects, we want bodies, but we're not making disciples. So Jesus did not soften the call here. He did not make it something easy. Uh, He actually is confronting them and he's challenging them. And it's because, somebody once said, appeal to self-interest always attracts the wrong kind of follower. Jesus imposed these kinds of terms because he desires disciples, not part-time admirers. And discipleship carries a cost that that not all people understand and not all people are willing to to count. Someone uh, was writing concerning a mission society, how that a mission society uh, was reported to have written to the missionary David Livingston. 
And they wrote and said this to him. They said, have you found a good road to where you are? If so, we want to send other men to join you. Livingston replied, if you have men who will come only if they know there's a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there is no road at all. That's the call of discipleship. Discipleship has a cost, and it's paid by the one wanting to be a disciple. So in this passage before us, uh, we have three people who are challenged to follow Jesus Christ as a disciple. And we're going to look at each one of these men individually. So first, verses 57 and 58. It says there that it happened as he journeyed on the road. Someone said to him, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. Now, when you cross-reference this with Matthew's uh, gospel, Matthew in chapter 8, verse 19, identified this man as being a teacher of the law. So this man is a religious man. He's impressed by Jesus Christ. Notice with me, and he impulsively volunteers to follow him wherever he goes. It's interesting how a religious person can impulsively say that they want to be sold out to Jesus Christ. That kind of thing happens all the time at crusades. It happens all the time at conferences just like this. There'll be message after message that challenges the listener. And before you know it, someone impulsively is saying, I'm going to go wherever Jesus calls me and do whatever he calls me to do. Sometimes that's said by somebody who's emotionally volunteering themselves to follow the Lord. I'll go anywhere. I'm going to go and do whatever he wants. It can happen after an especially powerful time of worship. It can happen after receiving out of the word of God. As a matter of fact, uh, the goal often of many sermons is to excite people in order to get them to serve. The minister wants to work the people up. He wants to challenge them. Then he says, give everything you have to the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice with me, Jesus didn't promote emotional responses because he knew that their enthusiasm would die when it was tested. He knew this man would fall away because he wasn't counting the cost. You need to consider what you are called to do. In Luke 14, 28, the question is asked, which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? See, being a Christian isn't an easy way of life. It's a very difficult life. Jesus in Matthew 7, 13 and 14 said it like this. He said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. There are few who find it. I used to work in Huntington Park at a place called Dresser Industries. And I had a guy who worked with me, his name was Gus. And I would share the gospel with him. I was in my early 20s at that time. It's hard to believe it's already been five years. <laughs> I used to share with him the gospel. And uh, wait, one day he finally approached me and he said, you became a Christian. You took the easy way out. And I said, man, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't. You don't know what you're talking about. Because the, following, the, the follower of Christ, while well, the way of following Christ is a way of death, it's dying to self. Jesus said you pick up your cross daily and you follow him. It's a way of death. It's not an easy way. It's a difficult path. Jesus pointed that out. It isn't easy to be a strong Christian, is it? It isn't easy if somebody gets in your face for you to back down and show humility, is it? It isn't easy to, to, to turn the other cheek. It isn't easy to do a lot of things that God has called us to do. It's a difficult thing. You die. You die to yourself. It isn't easy to be a good father. It's not easy to be a good husband. It's not easy to be a good son. You have to die to your impulses. You have to put the Lord first. You have to learn to put other people first. It's not an easy path, but it's the best path. You see, Jesus is calling disciples to consider what difficulties they're going to meet with and what strength they're going to need to enable them to follow him. And the disciple requires the power of God to support him or he will not be successful in following the Lord. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's pointing that out. Notice how he says in verse 58, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You see, instead of receiving him with open arms, he's issuing a challenge. He's saying, do you have any idea where such an offer will lead you? If you actually follow me, the decision can lead to hardship and even poverty. You see, contrary to what some are teaching today, to be a Christian doesn't automatically mean that you become wealthy. Jesus wasn't rich. And neither did he ever give a guarantee to his disciples that they would be. 
You can get guarantees from false teachers because false teachers will do that guarantee. They make Christianity into a heavenly investment scheme. Paul wrote concerning them in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. He said, these people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt, and they don't tell the truth. To them, religion is just a way to get rich. Yet true religion with contentment is great gain. You see, Paul wrote concerning his own life and his own financial situation, and it's interesting how he described himself in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. This is what he said concerning himself. He said, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. When he was speaking concerning Jesus, he gave us great insight. He said in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. So what was the challenge? He's saying, are you willing to live at a lower standard for my sake? Are you willing to trust God for your daily bread? Will you go wherever God guides you, and will you trust him to provide for you? Are you willing to forego the temptation to believe that you're entitled to be provided for in order to find pleasure in serving God and trusting him? Can you trust the Lord day by day? Can you hold fast to him through thick and through thin? Can you go through times of great blessing and times when it seems like the Lord's hand has been removed from you? Can you do that? You have to count the cost. You see, a desire for God should not be quenched. Yet, Jesus saw in this man a zeal, but he didn't have knowledge. He hadn't counted the cost of discipleship. So he made a promise, one that he wouldn't keep. We must count the cost, but whatever it may be, it is better than anything we could imagine. When you begin to follow the Lord and you see God moving in your life, I'll be honest with you now, I'll say this. This isn't in my notes, but I'll say it very briefly to you. I gave my heart to, to the Lord in 1970. It's 20 years old. If you'd have told me the journey that I was going to take over, now it's almost 45 years. If you were to tell me the journey that I was going to take when I committed my heart to Christ, I wouldn't have believed you. I wouldn't have believed you. If you'd have told me that one day I'd go throughout the world preaching the gospel. Man, I'm from Norwalk. You know, for me, throughout the world is going to East LA, cruising Whittier Boulevard. <laughs> That's going throughout the world. I mean, the far reaches of the world was Chino. I mean, Chino, man, that's the, that's the end of the earth, man. <laughs> who wants to go to Chino? I mean, chi who wants to go to Chino? I mean, chi chi I mean, who wants to go to a city that has as a mascot, an emblem of the city, a fly? I mean, it's a fly. That's, that's our mascot. I mean, who wants to go to Chino? You could never have told me that one day the Lord would give me a place to minister in a place called Chino. You could never have told me the life and the adventure that God would give to me. Listen, when you follow the Lord, there's nothing better than following Jesus Christ. He blesses you in ways you will never imagine. You could never imagine. It's worth it. It is worth every step, every tear, every pain, every suffering and sorrow. And yes, we go through those things. Absolutely we do. But there's nothing better, nothing greater, nothing more wonderful than following Jesus Christ. Are you willing? Are you willing? Are you willing to take less than you think you deserve to have more than you could imagine? In verses 59 and 60, he continues. He said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury the dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. Now, this other man actually enters. Notice the first one approached Jesus, but this one's different. Jesus is approaching him. And Jesus comes to this would-be disciple with a challenge. And notice the challenge. He says to him, follow me. Now, saying follow me is not unusual. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, when Jesus was calling Simon and Andrew, he said to them, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, he told Matthew to follow him. And Matthew arose and followed him. So Jesus approaches him and says to him, follow me. But notice his response. And I want you to see this. He says, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. It's interesting how he calls Jesus Lord. 
The word Lord means that you're greater than me. I'm submitted to you. You are Lord. It's not just a term of courtesy, especially when used to the, to the Lord. We're simply saying we will submit ourselves to you. You are the Lord. I am your servant. And so this isn't just a common courtesy whatsoever. When he speaks to him, says to him, Lord, that really carries much more import than what it seems at, at one time. You see, Jesus actually asked the question in Luke 6, 46, when he said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Why do you say that? Why do you call me something that you really don't mean? Why are you referring to me as Lord, and yet when I command you to do something, you, refi you refuse to do it? You see, this man was the opposite of the first one. He responded with hesitation, which makes me think that he already had been considering following the Lord. So he says, allow me, allow me to first go and bury my father. Now, when he said, let me go and bury my father, it's not as if his dad is just laying on some slab somewhere and I've got some business I have to take care of and I'll be right back. That was what is called a figure of speech. It was a way of saying, I must remain until my father dies. I must wait until he's dead. Why? Because... If I leave before he dies, then I don't receive a full inheritance. And that's why he was saying, allow me to bury my father. Let me put off following you until I am ready to do so. Because I've got things I want to do. There have been people who have said, I will follow the Lord, but I've got other things I want to do. I had people share with me on a couple of occasions, I still remember this, where they would share the gospel with me. And I said, yeah, one of these days I'll follow the Lord, one of these days, but I have things to do. For me, I, I had more sinning to do, to be honest with you. I wanted to do more drugs. I wanted to drink more. I wanted to be with more women. I have things to do. But when I'm old and, you know, too old to sin anymore, when I'm so old I can't sin anymore, then I'll follow the Lord. That was my, my mentality. My only hope for, for heaven was to marry, I was raised Catholic. My only hope for heaven was to marry a good Catholic woman who would pray my soul out of purgatory. That's what I thought would get me into heaven. I was going to marry a good Catholic woman who's going to, going to pray my soul out of purgatory. I was going to be, a, you know, I was a Catholic, baptized Catholic and a, 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 at four or five months old. You know, I got baptized over here in, in L.A. at the small church, the Plaza Church there by Alvera Street, like every other Mexican in Southern California. <laughs> you know, I did my first communion at St. Pius X Church in Santa Fe Springs. You know, I got my confirmation, St. Pius X Church, Santa Fe Springs. Grew up in Newark, like I said. That's where I went to church. And so I knew enough Catholic doctrine to get me in trouble. I didn't believe but I knew enough of it, and I ultimately thought that one day I'll marry a good Catholic gal, and she's going to pray my soul out of purgatory. That's true. I'm not just saying that because it sounds funny. It's, it's a fact. That's what I was going to do. I was going to be like my dad. My dad was a good, hardworking man. He worked five days a week. He took two days off on Sunday. He mowed the lawn, drank his beer, listened to mariachi, and that's what we did at my house when I grew up. That was it every weekend. That's what we did. That's what I was going to do. I was going to go to church on Christmas. I was going to go to church on Easter. I'd go to church for the weddings, especially for the receptions afterwards, and I'd leave before the fights. That's what I was going to do. <laughs> like my dad. But this man saying, I'll follow you at my convenience. I'll follow you when I'm ready. I'll follow you when everything is set up for my life and everything's cool and I can take care of myself. I had a friend of mine, his name was Nick, and I said to Nick, Nick, when are you going to come to faith in Christ? When are you going to give your heart to Christ? He said, when I make myself good enough. I'm not ready yet. When I make myself good enough. I said, you're an idolater. He says, what do you mean? I said, man, you can never make yourself good enough for God. That's why you need God, Nick. He makes you good enough for himself. You cannot make yourself good enough for God. And you don't come on your own terms. You see, money was important to this man. But the Bible tells us in Proverbs 23, 5, riches can disappear as though they had wings of a bird. Jesus' reply is simple to the point. He said, let the world take care of the things of the world. You need to choose the better part, the thing that will last. You need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. You see, we receive an inheritance that is greater than anything our parents could ever have left us. We receive eternal life. 
In Colossians 3.24, it says, Of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. In Revelation 21, verse 7, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God. He shall be my son. And so in effect, he was saying, I'll follow you, but at my convenience. I'm not willing to burn all my bridges behind me. But Jesus said, put God's business first. The rest is going to follow. And then in verse 61 and 62, another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I'll follow you, but let me first, those words, me first, let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. So his commitment was a let me first commitment. I'm not willing to lose my family. I want you and my family. But often following Jesus may cost you your mom, your dad, brother, a sister, sometimes even your own children or a wife. I've seen it, so have you. Where somebody's come to faith in Christ, and before you know it, grandma wants nothing to do with them anymore. Before you know it, your favorite sister doesn't want anything to do with you anymore. Your brother's saying things about you. I've seen it. In Matthew 10, 34 and 35, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to earth. No, I came to bring a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. I've come to be a divider, not a uniter in some ways. And this is what happens is when you come to the Lord and you have real faith in him, then those who don't have faith in him begin to see the difference between what you believe, what they believe, and it begins to create conflict and you begin to have problems. You know, when I got saved, um, and I'll say this briefly, some of you have already heard this, this story, so I'll be real brief with, as I share it. But when I got saved, I was a hippie. You know, there's a great movie out. Some of you have already seen it. The Neighborhood is a great movie. Well, that movie is about four guys who used to beat, beat people like me up all the time. I was a hippie. You know, for the first two years in high school, I was, I don't even know if I'm talking to anybody who'd know this. There's some older guys here. You'll, you'll know the word, a continental. Anybody remember that? So you guys, young guys, went to Continentals. Continentals was a, it was a style at that time. I used to wear my hair in a pompadour. You probably don't know what that is either, but it was all rolled in the front and all cool in the back. We used to wear tight uh, jeans and stuff. You know, it's, I was uh, I was a Continental, and and that's what I was. And we used to wear these these shoes that were really pointed in the front. We called them uh, cockroach killers because you could kill cockroaches in the corner with them. They were all pointy <laughs> like that. And so I used to wear my hair like that, and I was a Continental. But I went to a school called Sierra High School. Sierra High School's in Whittier. It used to, used to be a school in Whittier called Sierra. It's no longer a school there. But when I was there, it was what we called at that time a surfer school. Now, I was supposed to go to Santa Fe High School. Santa Fe High School was a Continentals, a lot of gangsters and stuff. Me, I went to Sierra because Santa Fe High was too crowded, and so they began to bus us to another school. While I was there the first two years, I was Continental. My brother was in a car club. You know, car clubs were real big at that time. He was in a club called the Emperors. They had the Majestics, and they had the Gestapo, and they had all kinds of gangs and stuff like that. My brother was in a car club, and that's kind of my life. That's what I was doing. I used to take an hour just ironing my Levi's, you know, and my T-shirts and my boxers, you know. I mean, <laughs> everything had to be having creases in them. I mean, that's the way it was. It took you a long time to comb your hair. I, I used to spray almost a whole can of hairspray to keep my hair all cool. But anyway, that's another thing. I mean, if you're riding a bike, the wind would whistle around your head when you were riding, you know. <laughs> but I went to a surfer school, and when I went to a surfer school, you know, within three years, I changed to, to loving going to the beach and body surfing and the whole nine yards. So I, I moved into that. And so... Some of you, I'm giving a history lesson to, there's a point to it in a moment, but um, that's why when the Calvary Chapel, when the revival hit, the revival was hitting a lot of kids like myself because uh, I had already seen the violence and that wasn't something I liked. So I moved towards the peace and the love, which is what the hippies were saying, because I wanted peace and I wanted love like everybody else. And I was just willing to say, this is what I want. 
but I couldn't find peace and love anywhere. It, it wasn't in the drugs I was taking. It wasn't in the relationships I had with my friends because anybody here who, does, who did drugs, not does drugs, did drugs, if you're doing drugs, you know this is true. But if you did drugs, you know this is true too. The relationships you have with people that you do drugs with are not close relationships. We pretended that they were. We would say, oh yeah, bro, love you, man. But if that guy turned around and he had a bottle of wine, I was drinking that wine before he came back. I would, I would rip his stuff off. If he had some joints here, he had three joints, I'd be smoking one before he came back. Man, what are you doing? I don't know. Some guy came in and smoked the joint. I don't know, you know. And that's the way we were. We ripped each other off. We'd steal stuff from each other all the time. That's what we did. And then we'd say, we love you. See, so when, I, when, the, when the gospel was preached, I actually encountered people who were giving without expecting to receive anything in return. That was unusual to me. And a lot of these guys were guys I used to get loaded with. And so now they're giving me things and things like that. I'm, I'm blowing my mind. and saying, these guys are generous. What's this all about? Because we're used to ripping each other off and lying to one another or ripping each other's girlfriends off. That's what we did in the name of love. Now I hear the gospel. And I'm around people who are real and, sin and sincere. They're genuine people who are very generous. I'd never been around that. They're kind. They're loving. They'll, they'll walk up. Man, I was raised in a way that, that men, don't, men don't hug other men. Men don't hug other men. My dad, when I was four years old, told me men do not kiss. You know, I'd kiss my father goodnight until I was four. He said, no, men don't kiss other men. We shake hands. So from the time I was four years old, I shook my dad's hand. I never gave him a kiss goodnight at all. I never told my dad I loved him uh, from the time I was four years old until I got saved at the age of 20 because men don't tell other men they love one another. They don't show affection to each other. They don't get near each other because men are that way. And we're still that way. I mean, your wife is with a, a friend or your girlfriend's with one of her friends and you, your girlfriend turns or your wife turns to her friend and says, I got to go to the bathroom. And she goes, I do too. And the girls get up and walk to the bathroom. Would you ever turn to your buddy and say, hey, man, I got to go to the head? <laughs> you know, we'll be back. I don't think so. I mean, you'll, you'll be talking to one another up to the toilet door. You open the door and you get quiet. You go and do your business, come back out. And then you start talking. That's men, you know. So I was around that all my life. And now I got a guy named George. And George is starting to do things like hug me. And I'm like, what's this all about? You know, bro, I love you, man. What are you talking about love and hugging? And what's this all about? I, didn't, I was not comfortable with it. It's not that I was threatened or anything. It's just I wasn't comfortable with it. I'm not used to this. I'm not used to seeing this kind of thing. This is feminine. This isn't masculine. This isn't what guys do. If guys like each other, we hit each other. You know, or we call each other names. You know, hit them in the head or something. That's what we do. That's how my dad showed me he loved me. I'd walk by and he'd hit me. And my mom, I'd say, why does daddy hit me? He loves you. Oh. I wish you didn't love me that much. You guys, many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's just the way it was. That's just the way. My dad would show me affection after three beers. If I walked by, he might rub my head like that. And that was my dad, and that's how I grew up. And now I've got these guys who are hugging me, so I give my heart to Christ because I sense the need for love. I need love, and God gives love. But that doesn't mean I change that fast. Because now they want to hold my hand when they're praying. <laughs> I can still remember it. Some of you guys can too. When we had prayer meetings and it would be a bunch of guys. And they'd say, let's hold hands. And I'd say, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I still remember they'd, they'd take your hand. And I would squeeze it real hard. You're not going to get any ideas about me. And they turn and say, you brute. No. <laughs> You're so strong. <laughs> My friend George would hug me. He put his face next to mine. You know, it's cool because I read the Bible and it said that you greet one another with a brotherly kiss. So that when those little hippie girls would come in, I'd say, yeah, let's be biblical. But it means that the guys would actually kiss the guys. Think about that for a minute. All of that is to say I'd never been around real love. I'd never been around affection. I knew what it was theoretically. I knew what it was as my mom explained it. My mom was more affectionate than my dad. But I never heard the word I love you. 
I never saw real, saw real affection. I never saw any of that because men don't cry. Men don't show emotion. Men get up and work when they're sick. They work five days a week, sometimes six if they have to. They put food on the table. They take care of that family. That's what I learned, and it's a good thing to learn. It's a good thing to learn. But my dad never taught me how to love. It took Jesus to do that. It took Jesus. Jesus through his people and me reading the Bible, where the Bible says Jesus picked up kids. Imagine that. He picked up children, and he held them in his arms. Do you know the first kid I ever held in my arm? I really held in my arm and loved was my first baby. I didn't hold other people's babies. If you brought your baby to me, I'd look at your baby and say, oh, you want to hold them? And I'd put my hands, you wouldn't even notice I was doing it, but I'd put my hands behind my back and I'd take a step away. And I'd say, nice baby. I didn't want to hold your baby. I wasn't used to it, I didn't want that. Why would I do that? That's your kid, you, you know, you hold them. I didn't know any of that. I didn't learn any of that until I began to read the Bible. Do you know I didn't, I didn't cry unless I was drunk? You know, that's where we had excuses, man. When you drink a lot, you can, you can say, man, I was just loaded, man, I was just drunk. Man. You know, and, and when, you, when you're drunk, you can do two things. You can, you can show your anger and blame it on the alcohol, or you can show your affection and blame it on the alcohol. You can do both. You can do both, and you can do both at the same time. You could be weeping, telling your girl, man, I love you, I love you, man. But if you ever go out on me, I'll kill you. I mean, you can, <laughs> in the same conversation, that's a fact, that's a fact. And you can blame it on the alcohol. You can do that. But the bottom line is, is that the Lord wants to do something that is beyond the me first kinds of things. He wants us to have a relationship with him so that he can transform our lives. And after I gave my heart to the Lord, the first thing I wanted to do is make sure those I love the most would come to faith in him. That was the key. You see, this man didn't want to come and follow Christ because he thought he was going to lose his family. When I came to Christ, I made a decision that if there's anything that I will do everything I can not to do, it will be to not lose my family. So I came home, and the day I got saved, December 27, 1970, I gave my testimony to my sisters, and my sister Madeline that night gave her heart to Christ. Three weeks later, my mom and dad are there seated at the kitchen table talking like they used to on a Sunday night, and I walked in, I'd been reading the Bible, I read a passage of scripture that I'd been reading, I looked at my dad, I said, I don't know what this, uh, what this means, but I do know this, it's not speaking to me, it's speaking to you. And I said to him, Dad, I said, you're a good man, you're the best man I'll ever know, but you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. I said, Daddy, I love you, and I don't want to go to heaven without you. Bow your head, you're gonna receive Christ right now as your Lord and your Savior. And my dad and my mom both got saved there at that kitchen table. My, my, <laughs> amen. Amen. My brother, my brother resisted for three years. He gave his heart to the Lord. I started teaching a Bible study in Ontario. That's what brought me out into the Inland, Inland Empire, is to teach my brother a Bible study in September of 1974. Actually, seven, yeah, 70, yeah, 74. I started teaching a Bible study, and a young lady by the name of Marie Lopez showed up. She needed to get saved. She got saved. She needed to be discipled. She's been discipled now for all these years because I married her. That's how, I'm, that's how I met my wife. She came to faith in my Bible study. You see, and then my sister Becky, who went into lesbianism for 20-some years, she got saved back in 98. Came forward at an invitation I gave at an Easter service here in, uh, well, actually in the Inland Empire. And she gave her heart to Jesus Christ. And she's been serving the Lord since 1998. God changes lives when you commit yourself to him. He can transform you. And that's what Jesus is calling. No, I want to go and, and, and I want to be with my family. Uh, I, I, I want to go bid them farewell. And the Lord says, no, you follow me. There was a man, and I'm going to close with this, by the name of David Livingston. He was a missionary. You've heard him. All of you have heard of him. Let me share something with you about somebody who follows the Lord. In the 1860s, David Livingston, the most famous missionary in the last 500 years, returned to Great Britain on his first vacation 
after 16 years of traveling in the interior of darkest Africa. Livingston was asked to speak at the University of Glasgow, but perhaps he would have declined if he knew what was in store for him. It was the custom of undergraduates those days to heckle the speakers that came, and they were very well prepared for this preacher. They had pea shooters and trumpets and rattles, noisemakers of every description. David Livingston walked out on the platform. He's, here stood the man who had walked 11,000 miles all over Africa. His left arm hung limply at his side, having been almost ripped off from his body by a huge lion. His face was dark and leathery brown from 16 years in the African sun. His face was furrowed with innumerable lines from African fever that racked his emaciated body. He had been attacked by savages and by Turks who hunted Africans to become slaves. Livingston was half dead from rheumatic fever and half blind from a branch that slapped him in the eyes in the jungle. The students stared and they knew that here was a man that was literally being burned out for God. Not a rattle moved, not a foot shuffled, and a hush crept over the vast auditorium as they listened in total silence as David Livingston told about his journeys and the tremendous needs of this vast African population. Shall I tell you, he said, what sustained me in the midst of all those toils, hardships, and incredible loneliness? It was a promise, the promise of the Lord that I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. It was this promise that Christ would be with me personally, right next to me every hour of each day that gave me the courage to continue day after day, Livingston said. How would you live if you knew Christ was standing right beside you right now and each day? How would you live differently? For David Livingston, Jesus Christ was with him. Livingston lived as if Jesus Christ was right next to him each moment. In Livingston's diary, we find Livingston's tremendous prayer. Lord, send me anywhere, only go with me. Lay any burden on me, only sustain me. Sever any ties that tie, but the tie that binds me to your service and to your heart. And Jesus said, David, I'm with you always. Livingston's wife, Mary, finally came to meet David in Africa. And for months, she, she sailed on the ocean. And then she cruised up the steamy mosquito swarm, swarming rivers. Soon after she greeted her husband, she contracted African fever. Night after night, day after day, David sat up with her, wiped her fevered brow. Slowly she worsened and finally took her last breath, and Mary was dead. David Livingston buried her under a huge tree, and he fell on that mound of dirt, and he wept. The Lord reminded Livingston of his prayer, sever any ties but the tie that binds me to your service and to your heart. His body was broken, his loved ones were gone. He seemed alone and discouraged. He was overcome. How did he deal with his sorrow? Listen to the words that he wrote in his diary. My Jesus, my King, my life, my all. I again consecrate my life to you. I shall place no value on anything I possess, on anything I may do, except in relation to the kingdom of Christ. When he arrived back home, he found that natives had stolen his food, and worst of all, they stole his medicine. Livingston, Livingston, for Livingston, the loss of these essential things was a death sentence. He cried out to God, God, you promised to be with me. Then he heard the sound, and he looked up from his prayer. For five years, he had not seen the face of a white man, and now in the midst of the interior of Africa, he looked up, and he saw a white face walking toward him. Behind the, the, this white man was a whole caravan, above them flying, the, win, flying in the wind the American flag. It was Henry Stanley who uttered those unforgettable words, Dr. Livingston, I presume. For four months, Stanley lived in the same hut with Livingston. He nursed Livingston back to health. Stanley had been an atheist, but after those four months living with Livingston, Stanley became a Christian. Livingston refused to return to civilization with Stanley. Instead, Livingston plunged deeper into Africa. For Livingston, the end was approaching. His diary said, Lord, help me to finish thy work this year to thine honor. And so he did. He came to a place where his strength was completely spent. His feet were lacerated and ulcerated with boils. He had nothing to eat but hard corn for months. Gradually, all his teeth were loosened and fell out. He was deserted by everyone except three of his followers who tried to carry his very sick body back to England. Livingston could not walk. He couldn't stand. He couldn't go another step. Was this the end of his life? No. Livingston commanded his friends to put him on a stretcher and carry him onward. I will not swerve one hair's breadth while I still have life. This is a man of commitment. Deeper and deeper he plunged into Africa on a stretcher. Propped up, he proclaimed the riches of the gospel of Jesus Christ to all he came into contact with. 
and then there came the day when Livingston couldn't even be moved. It was pouring rain. A small temporary hut was quickly made. Livingston was lying on his cot in the middle of the night when the servant boy, who lay across the doorway to keep out wild beasts, heard Livingston stir. The servant boy got up and saw Livingston agonizingly roll out of his cot and on his knees and with his hands folded in prayer. After a while, the boy went back to sleep. But in the morning, when he looked at Livingston, he saw he was still in prayer. Several people came asking for Livingston, but the boy told him, he's in prayer, don't disturb him. Finally, the boy became concerned, said to Livingston, Buana, no answer. Buana, still silence. He crept closer to him, touched his cold cheek. Livingston died on his knees in prayer. Livingston had lived his life in the presence of Christ. He left this life in the presence of Christ. Jesus said, I'm with you always, and Christ kept his promise. What a joyful arrival in heaven Livingston must have had. His life consisted of 39 years traveling, 29,000 miles across Africa, bringing light to darkness. Two million Africans were brought to the gospel, and the light he brought continues to shine to this day. Every mile that Livingston walked or was carried, he was strengthened by the promise that Jesus said, I am with you always. Follow me, Jesus said. I will make you fishers of men. Follow him. There's nothing, nothing in this world worth more than following Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that you would work on us now and continue to build in this foundation of love for you. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you, men.